Boer versus Brits. It's a clash of culture, language and military doctrine that shaped the history of South Africa. The two sides have clashed many, many times, such as at the Battle of Congella in 1842 and Boomplatz in 1848. It's fair to say that we British have lost many, many battles during our long military history. But losing a war is a very rare occurrence. The first Anglo-Boer War of 1880-81 was one of those times. In fact, the veterans of this war didn't even receive a campaign medal. It's a war the army wanted to forget. Today on the Redcoat History Podcast and YouTube channel, I'm joined by the brilliant historian John LeBand to discuss the structure and tactics of the Boer and British forces, and we look at why the Redcoats were so completely beaten by this small band of armed farmers. If you want to know more about the war, then please see my previous episode, and also be sure to subscribe, as in two weeks I'll be walking the battlefield of Majuba Hill, a stunning and evocative place to visit within a three-hour drive of Johannesburg. Also, be sure to check the description below, as I have a discount code for you that will save you 20% on John's book about the Battle of Majuba, and also get you a discount on his new one on the war between the Zulus and the Boers that included the Battle of Blood River. John began our chat today by explaining the organisation of the Boer commandos. If you think, you know, when you look at the Boer population of the Transvaal, there are only 35,000 to 40,000. They're very small. I mean, the, the Africans in the Transvaal outnumbered them 20 to 1. Um, so they're a small community. But all men between the age of 16 and 60 were liable for commando service. Now, this went right back to the Dutch East India Company in the Cape at the very beginning of the 18th century when they set up these kind of local militia to um, fight on the frontier. So it's a very old system which the Boers took with them to the Transvaal during the Great Trek. So so there they have it, and it's a system whereby, okay, you're liable to serve, you are called up and you arrive with your horse, your ammunition, your, your, your 50 rounds of ammunition, your eight days of supplies, and um, you're ready to go. And it is very much an ad hoc um, situation. You have your officers, your felt cornetta and all the rest of it, but it's not quite as egalitarian as you might think. The British always thought, oh, these guys just, you know, just elect their officers and this means nothing. But in fact, the guys elected to be officers were always local bigwigs, in fact, the local big farmer, the local, the local important person who already had an important place in the community and others were used to um, obeying. However, because it was this egalitarian thing, they would argue back, I mean, you know, the officers didn't have the opportunity to court-martial them or prison them or anything else. If a boy didn't like it, he could just get in his wagon and go home again. You know, so um, so it was a fairly loose kind of system like that. Um, but it did work because you have this sort of sense of mission. At least you do sometimes. When they were fighting Sekakuni and Bapedi, they didn't get excited. And one reason they gave up, the slightest set back, they just went home. They thought, I'm enough of this, you know. Um, so when they're motivated against the British, yes, they were going to hold on to it. And what one always forgets too, they went on commando with a large number of Achtereas or um, black black support staff. Um, like auxiliaries? Own, well, auxiliaries, people who basically had were working on their farms, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, many of whom had been actually captured as so-called apprentices or slaves as children in wars against other African societies and had then been sort of acculturated, Africanerized, if you like. And and they were there to um, do all the dirty stuff, um, to carry and cook and slaughter and herd and all the rest of it. And they also sometimes took part in the fighting too. Um, very much so in the second Anglo-Boer War, not so much in the first. So so you have this great sort of body of men, not that well organized, but motivated, not in uniform, of course. Um, they're all just in their everyday working clothes. Um, they would arrive with their wagons, which would be their transport, their, well, their, their, the equivalent of caravans. They'd be their, their homes, if you like, for, while, while they're on campaign. So that's how they would do it. Yeah. And we, we have this view... Uh that the average Boer commando soldier was 
born with a rifle in their hand, a, a natural mm. horseman. Mm. How true mm. is that? Were, were they just naturally tough men used to being out in the field or is there a bit of mythologizing around that yes yes and no because they, they were indeed brought up on farms most of them look um in the transvaal about almost all the boers lived in fact in the countryside there were about five thousand english-speaking people who um really ran, ran what what economy there was in the towns etc but most afrikaners lived in the countryside so right from an early age they were hunting they were shooting they'd learned not to waste ammunition which was difficult and expensive to come by they'd learned to gauge range which british soldiers certainly didn't very accurately from their hunting um they learned how to use terrain obviously stalking stalking their animals and all the rest of it but what was happening by this period they were so successfully shooting out the white ga- the, the the wild game that younger boers were having less opportunity by the stage to actually go hunting so the older ones were very very skilled the younger ones less so because the older ones have been such successful hunters <laughs> that's the irony of that one <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so were there a lot of young young guys in the commandos then who maybe had to look to the older men for for guidance and yeah. teaching yeah yeah, it, it was a combination, and you find at to jump ahead to something like the Battle of Majuba, that the older guys, all right, more scant of breath with better shots, they were at the bottom of the mountain giving covering fire, accurate covering fire, while the younger guys were scrambling up. So, yes, so, so they did sort of work like that. The older experience, better shots um, were used for covering fire, which in the whole um, Boer method of fighting, this um, fire and movement, doctrine with which they followed this is absolutely essential because you are always moving with covering fire and i like mounted infantry you you use the horses for um to get to where you want to be quickly and effectively but once you're there you get off the horse because don't forget the boers have been fighting african societies for decades societies say like the Basutu in particular or the Bapedi too up in their mountain strongholds and all the rest of it so this wasn't you know charging around on horses this was getting off your horse and skirmishing up a mountainside I mean that's the kind of fighting they're actually used to by the stage so indeed so you've got this you probably usually go up with two skirmishing lines um, and with a third line with um, covering fire over the top of that so Obviously, the first line would go up, that also have covering fire. Then the second line would join the first line, and up you'd go in this leapfrogging kind mm, of way. Leapfrogging but, over in front of one another, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's the way they would do it, yeah. And as they were such good shots, I mean, the British found in all the battles of this war, I mean, and they were simply completely outshot by the Boers, that when you look at the, at the wounds the British received, they were almost all in the head, um, or the upper torso. In other words, those small bits of the body over the parapet, wherever they might happen to be, and there they would. I mean, you had you had corpses with six or seven bullet holes in the head. I mean, bang, bang. You know, it's just, um, you know, they're ready. The boys were very, very good shots. And the British sw- worked. <laughs> so, well, I was about to say, switching to the British then of the time, can you give yeah. us a sense of how big a force Britain had in the country at that time and how many yeah. men might have been available to try and, try and quash this rebellion at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, you know, we're talking about a tiny war here because, all right, just to go back to the Boers, 35,000 people altogether, maybe 6,000 men between, you know, 16 and 60 who might be... Um, called up for for action but you never had a boer commander of more than about 800 men in any one place um the british had only about 1500 men in garrison in the transvaal um colonel belairs who was um the 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 district district commander there i mean you had 1500 men they were scattered over six garrisons around the country small little groupings you know so that's not very much when Colley, um, General Colley, put together his relief force to um, invade the Transvaal and rescue the, the British garrisons. His force was also only about um, 1,500 men strong. It was absolutely tiny. By the end of the war, however, when the British sent in reinforcements, there were some 15,000 British available, but they were never used because 
they decided not to pursue the war. But by the end of it, they certainly had the manpower to win a war if they decided to continue. But we're really looking at battles here, which in any other context would be thought of as small skirmishes, you know, with the men available. I mean, something like in Gogo or Skensgurkta, as it's called, um, there are about 250 men on each side. That, that's all, you know, very small. Yeah, tiny, really, when you think about its, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. its impact yeah. on South African history. Yeah, no, indeed. Yeah, very and, small forces. And tactically, and, and we can look at a few specific battles uh, mm. shortly, but just in general, mm. tactically, what were the weaknesses with the British force? Because obviously, as we know, they pretty much go yeah. on to lose virtually every every fight well, they're in. What, what were their weaknesses? Not, yeah, not virtually everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to be generous. Um, <laughs> generous, yeah, yeah. They lost them all. Um, look, what is wrong with the British wasn't so much their military doctrine because by this period by the 1880s having fought so many small wars against um, irregulars of one sort or another around the world and having been armed for a number of years now with breech loading rifles they knew what to do they knew about skirmishing lines they knew about um, yeah um, the same sort of tactics that, that the Boers were using they knew about this kind of thing um, the problem is it's how well it is actually implemented. Um, that, is a, that is the one problem. Um, the other problem was that, well, their firing was really bad. Um, again, there was musketry instruction, um, but usually it's at Aldershot, etc., against fixed targets. They weren't used to shooting against moving targets. Um, and they had very little practice. The, the British Army was very stingy about wasting ammunition in practice. Um, after the war, you had a musketry commission that was called afterwards that really tried to change a lot of this. But firing was really unpracticed in many ways. Um, soldiers also waited for their officers to tell them at what range to set their sights. So an officer here, right now, 400 yards, 300 yards, 200 yards, etc. The Boers weren't idiots. The first thing they did in all these battles was shoot down the officers and NCOs. So no one was giving orders anyway. Um, and, and you found the men in so many of the battles, when the Boers picked up their rifles, they were completely missighted, if you like, firing much too high, never sort of getting down to the, to the right kind of um, range at all. So that was a problem. Um, and there all kinds of mistakes, like at Majuba, um, the British knew in this new era of long-range um, breech-loading weapons that they needed to build shelter trenches. They didn't build shelter trenches at um, Majuba. At least a few commanders did in places here or there along the perimeter, but generally they didn't. So they're completely sort of vulnerable to, 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 to Boer fire. So, so in other words, what is wrong with the British is not so much not knowing what to do, but not doing what they ought to have done. You know, that's really how it worked, yeah. Um, I mean, the worst um, was at the Battle of Lang's Neck when they tried to break through the Boer line. The Boers were in this circle of mountains, in trenches behind rocks and all the rest of it. And up they went in column, for goodness sake. And then when, when they're nearly, near, nearly at the top, they then tried to um, get into into skirmishing line and move maneuver into that and were completely that didn't work because by then they were being you know, enfiladed on every single side and then they tried a banner charge which was hopeless and then they retreated it almost so, sounds like they were bringing napoleonic tactics to a modern war well in fact at the battle of lang's neck this is the last time the british actually carried the queens and regimental colors into battle up they marched the colours flying, um, with all the young, the colour party being shot down again and again and again, and the next load of brave idiots were picking up the colours and carrying on. Um, so this is the last time this is actually ever done in war, from by the British. And so, at least the British learned some valuable lessons from this war, including the futility of carrying their regimental colours into a modern battle. In two weeks, I'll be walking the battlefield of Majuba, and then John will be joining me again in a month's time to talk about the life of the British commander, Major General Sir George Pomeroy Colley. I'll see you then. <laughs>